on today's episode of The Walk. You cannot be marginal in your commitment to God. You can't be marginal in your in coming to church. You know, you're setting a model, you're setting a standard for your kids. Welcome to The Walk. Today I'm going to talk to you about vision, moving your life forward. You know, God has gifted us, gifted us human beings with this unique ability to dream dreams and to see visions. Someone said the language of the Holy Spirit is dreams and visions. God often speaks to us by the Holy Spirit through dreams and visions. You know, and I believe that every great accomplishment that's ever been done, started out with a dream, started out with a vision, started out with a thought that came into someone's vivid imagination. I believe that what you envision, what you can imagine, can determine what you will do in your, in your life and with your life. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, Paul said, the Apostle Paul says, Never doubt God's mighty power to work in you and accomplish all this. He will achieve infinitely more than your greatest request, your most unbelievable dream, and exceed your wildest imagination. He will outdo them all, for His miraculous power constantly energizes you. What He's saying is this. What you see, what you can envision, is what you can do with God or through God. What you see or what you perceive is what you can achieve. You see, you need vision for your life. We need vision for every area of our life because vision is not, what, not just what you can see. Vision is what you can do. Proverbs 29, verse 18. Where there is no vision, the people perish. The NIV version says, where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. In other words, they live carelessly with no sense of purposely, purpose, aimlessly, selfishly. See, what we see, what we envision, can determine what we will do with our life. Vision is so powerful. In Genesis chapter 13 is the story of Abraham and his nephew Lot. I love stories about Abraham because and I, I love to say this that, and tell people that and remind people that Abraham is kind of like the father of our faith. He's the, uh, the uh, prototype of a New Testament believer. And the way that God approached and he, he dealt with Abraham is a picture of how God deals with us. And so this story is about Abraham and his nephew Lot. And the story says that God had so greatly blessed Abraham with livestock and herds and flocks that he had to hire all kinds of herdsmen to, to take care of all his flocks. And at the same time, his, lot, his nephew Lot was living with him. And God was blessing Lot as well with stocks, with, with livestock and, and herds and flocks. And the space and the area that they were living in was too, getting too small for them. And the Bible says that Lot's herdsmen began to argue with Abraham's herdsmen. They were arguing about where they were going to graze their flocks. And the land was too small for them. That area was too small. And so Abraham approached his nephew Lot and said, listen, this place is too small for us. We've got to spread out. We've got to split up. He said, you go one way and I'll go another way. And whatever direction you go, I'll go in the opposite direction. You know, why fight each other? After all, we're family. And so Lot agreed. And the Bible says that Lot cast his eyes on the fertile plains of the Jordan. And he saw that it was well watered, it was a, 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 like a well-watered garden. And he said, that's where I want to go. And he, he took his possessions, his family took everything. And the Bible says that he pitched his tents near a town, town called Sodom. And Abraham and all that he owned and possessed went the other way. And so God tells Abraham to lift up his eyes. And 
He shows him the land before him. Genesis 13, verse 14. The Lord said to Abram, after Lot has, had departed from him, look from where you are, to the north and the south, to the east and west. All the land you see I will give you and your offspring forever. I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth, so that if anyone could count the dust, then your offspring could be counted. Go, walk through the length and the breadth of the land, for I am giving it to you. So there was this land just waiting for him to occupy, for him, for his kids, for his grandkids. But here's the thing, that land was not like the fertile plains of the Jordan. That land was dangerous, it was rugged, it was uncharted, it was unplowed, it was unknown territory, this hill country of Judea. And God says, I'm giving you this land, this uncharted, dangerous land, hills, mountains, peaks, as far as your vision can see. He's saying, occupy, occupy that land. I'm giving you this land as an opportunity for you and for your family. You know, I'm reminded about the stories of the Old West, of the pioneers, when the pioneers came to settle the West. They would get their horses together, they would hitch up their horses to covered wagons, and they would just load up those wagons. They loaded up their wagons. Moms and dads would load up their kids, and if they had babies, they'd load up their babies, they load up their livestock, and they would head out West. Yes, the land was dangerous. Yes, it was unknown. It was uncharted. It was unplowed, but they set out because they saw the opportunity for a bigger life and for a better life, and so they set out. You know, some of them even settled near the foot of these mountain ranges. They had gone so far, and they settled there, and they began to plow the land there. But as they began to, as they looked at those mountain ranges, this, their curiosity was piqued. Excuse the pun. Their curiosity was piqued. And they wondered, what's on the other side of those mountains? And so they would summon the courage and the strength, and they traversed those rugged mountains to explore and to possess what was on the other side. You know, they weren't just thinking about themselves. They were thinking about the generations. You know, we need to be thinking about the generations. Someone said, as believers, we need to think three. Three generations. The way we affect affects three generations not just the generations you're in now, but your, the way you live as a believer in Christ affects your kids and your grandkids as well. You know, think, gener think generationally. Think beyond yourself. Think three. Get a long-term vision for yourself. And not only that, get a long-term vision for God's house, the house that you belong in. See, your vision needs to be a part of a greater vision. Your vision needs to be intersected, connected, to God's great vision, the vision for He has for the church, the church that you belong to. You know, as a pastor, I love the kids in, in our church. You know, and there's church statisticians say that when you're counting the members of your church, just count the adults. But I thought, no, no, that's not right because kids count and kids count now. You know, most kids can pray down heaven better than most adults can. Kids really count. You know, and I believe that as, as parents, as adults, we need to work hard to connect our kids and our grandkids to the church now. But that means something. That means that you cannot be marginal. You cannot be marginal in your commitment to God. You can't be marginal in, your, in coming to church. You know, you're setting a model. You're setting a standard for your kids and how they're going to serve God. You know, that means you can't be marginal. You can't, you've got to watch your attitude and what you say about church. And what you say about your pastor, take a note of that. You know, let's plant good seed in our kids right now. There's a story in 1 Chronicles chapter 4. And it's a story of a guy named Jabez, whose family had just returned from Babylon. And they'd come from a bitter past. They'd been in exile. And they returned to a land, their homeland, which was devastated and impoverished. And there was nothing really there left for them. But Jabez... Jabez was not content. Jabez believed that God had better for him. He envisioned a better place. 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verse 10 says, Jabez cried out to the, to the God of Israel, Oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my territory. Let your hand be with me 
keep me from harm so that I will be free from pain. And then the next verse says this, and God granted his request. God heard his prayer. God answered his prayer. And God enlarged his territory. You know, God wasn't upset. Like, what's wrong with what you got? You know, God heard his prayer. God blessed him. Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 10, this is the Passion Version. A thief has only one thing in mind. He wants to steal, slaughter, and destroy. In other words, he wants to keep you small. But Jesus said, but I have come to give you everything in abundance, more than you expect. Life in its fullness until you overflow. He said, the devil wants to keep you small, but I want to make you big. You know, God responds to vision. I believe that heaven responds to people who want to grow, who want to expand their influence and their territory. And I say it all starts with vision. It starts with a vision. You've got to see it before you can get it. The first thing you need to see, the first thing we need to see as believers is this. We need to see how big God is. We need to see the bigness of God. The question is, how big is God to you? How big is God inside of you? I want to give you some points here. Seven things, seven things you need to know about God's bigness. Number one, first thing is that God wants you to live a life that's full, that's abundant. God wants you to live a big life. I want to tell you, God is for you. God is not against you. But a lot of people don't see God that way. They see that God is a, a, a God that's always trying to limit them. As soon as they want to get ahead and they want to rise up and they want more, it seems like, to them, they think that God wants to keep on slapping them down, keep pushing them down. But I want to tell you, God's not like that. God wants us to expand and to grow in life, to push past the limitations that the devil, the world, the culture tries to put on you. So God wants, and the first thing you need to know, God wants you to live a big life. Number two, God doesn't disqualify you because of your past, of your past failures, your past hurts and fears. You know, God doesn't look at us and say, well, I don't know if I can use that guy. I don't know, just too much bad stuff that he's gone through, too many failures, too many fears in his life. God doesn't say that. You know, if, instead, God wants to help you move way beyond all those things, things that shrink us and that, things that keep us small. We'll be right back after this short break. Coming up on The Walk. We need to have the courage to keep relating to people, not just the people we've always related to, but one of the most exciting things in life is to meet new people. Let's expand. Let's be generous with our lives. You know, God doesn't want us to live in the limitations that the world or the devil or even the culture puts on, uh, around us. And, and God wants us to do something. You know, and I'm, I believe as believers, one thing we need to do is we need to read our Bible because there's power in God's Word. When we get it into our heart, when we get it into our spirit, there's power. You know, the Bible brings us health. The Bible makes us stronger and it enlarges our understanding of who God is and who we are in relation to him and our purpose in this life. So God doesn't, want, doesn't disqualify us because of our past failures and because of our fears. Number three, God wants you to live openly and generously. You know, He wants us to live open, engaged, and lives that interact with other people. You know, be generous with yourself, with other people. Listen to the words of Proverbs chapter 11, verse 24 the message version. The world of the generous gets larger and larger. The world of the stingy or the selfish gets smaller and smaller. And when you think about it, when God came into your life, when God entered your world, He came through other people. When God wants to speak to you, He speaks through other people. When God wants to teach you, He'll bring other people to help teach you. When God wants to love you, He brings people around you to love you. When God cares for you, He brings people around you 
to really care for you. See, other people are always involved in our life and should be. But here's the problem. And it's a problem with society. It's a problem with humanity. People tend to hurt people. You know, we have a saying that hurt people will end up hurting other people. And because they've been hurt by other people, suddenly they want to keep their distance from people, so they keep their distance. And that's why we as believers in Christ, we should be the least offendable people on earth. We should be the most teachable people on earth. We should be the most vulnerable people on earth. We know we need to be bigger inside. We need to have the courage to keep relating to people, not just the people we've always related to, but one of the most exciting things in life is to meet new people. Let's expand. Let's be generous with our lives. You know, can I make a suggestion to you? Now, I heard Pastor Kevin Gerald make this suggestion, and it, and it's, and it really kind of set me back, and, it, and it's, it is this. Here's the suggestion. Be easy to talk to about the hard things in your life. Let me say that again. Be easy to talk to about the hard things in your life. You know, some people get so upset when you talk to them. To them. You've got to be so careful to talk when you talk to some people because they've been hurt and they end up setting up boundaries in their heart so that they cannot receive even the smallest bit of advice or, or any sense of correction. And they always, they always have somebody kind of defending them. Somebody's always running def defense for them. And they're telling them, well, before you talk to that person, be careful. You got to talk to them a different way. Well, maybe you shouldn't talk to them about that because they won't listen. They'll get upset and they'll leave. You know, do we want to be like that? Do we, is that who we want to be? Is that what we want to be? No, we don't. You know, let's, let's interact with people. Let's, let's, let's deal with those issues in our heart. And let's be a part of a group of people that we can relate to, that we can receive from, and that we can give to. I said, be a part of a small group, a life-giving group, and a life-receiving group. God wants us to be generous and open with our life. Number four, God wants us to have big faith, greater vision, you know, and to pray even bigger prayers than we're praying right now. I said this, that your prayers will always reveal your faith. You know, and your prayers can actually reveal your future that you're going to have. I love the words of D.L. Moody. If God is your partner, then make your plans big. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 17, verse 20. I promise you, if you have faith inside of you, no bigger than the size of a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move away from here and go over there, and you will see it move. There is nothing you cannot do. Jesus is talking about prayer. Prayer can literally move mountains. Here's a question. Did you ever feel sometimes that what you're asking God for is foolish? Did you ever feel that way? Prayers like this. Well, God, well, God, I don't even know if I should be e even asking you, you know, asking you for this, for this need, but my family's going, God, and we're tired of renting. We'd like to own our own home. And I know, God, that, you know, we have more than 90% of the rest of the world, but God, can you please? You know, some people pray like that. You know, maybe even, I've even prayed a prayer like that. We pray as if our prayers are, are offending God, and we're praying apologetically like, please, God, I can, can I have that? Well, you know, God's not uh, offended with our prayers. God's not looking down from heaven and He's shouting, stop praying that. Because there's a million kids over here that are starving. You know, God's not offended with our prayers. God loves it when we cry out and we pray to Him for bigger things. God's not upset. Listen to what Jesus said. If you being natural, if you be natural fathers, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask Him? We have a heavenly Father that wants to give us we're His children. He wants to bless us. So let's stop limiting God and let's stop putting boundaries around ourselves. Number five, God wants us to integrate our lives into the culture that we live in to be salt and light, to be witnesses for Christ. The Bible says that we are in this world, but we're not of this world. 
But while we're here, we're here to make a difference. And here's another thing. We're not here to be the fault finders of the world. D.L. Moody says, you may find hundreds of fault finders among professed Christians, but all their criticism will not lead one single solitary soul to Christ. What he's saying is this, let's not be religious. Let's not always be condemning, always be criticizing, always be judging people. No, let's, let's, let's love people instead. Romans chapter 2, verse 4. Or do you show contempt for the riches of His kindness, forbearance and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? No, let's be bigger. Let's be bigger. Let's lift people. Let's love people. Let's encourage people instead of put them down. You know, because it's God's kindness that leads them to repentance. Number six, God wants us to grow. God wants us to grow relationally, emotionally, physically, and yes, even financially. God is concerned with all of us. God is holistically concerned about you. Think about Jesus. Jesus came. He was sent from heaven. He came to save our soul. But not only did He do that, Jesus also came to heal our bodies. He came to feed the multitudes. He came to love people. He came to, to help people. He came to care for people. Even the most practical needs Jesus was concerned about. I love the prayer to pray that I, I pray in John chapter 3, verse 2, the Amplified Version. Beloved, I pray that in every way you may succeed and prosper and be in good health physically, just as I know your soul prospers spiritually. You know, the scripture is telling that God wants to bless us in every area of our life. Last point, God wants us to occupy. God wants us to own land. God wants to buy us to buy buildings and buy spaces and, and, and build prosperous businesses. You know, let's get rid of this religious concept that says that Christians need to be poor. You know, that's, the, that's what I call the poverty mentality. The poverty mentality says that Christians need to be, need, need to be poor. P Christians cannot prosper. That, you know, it's not selfish for us to want to grow and to expand. It's not selfish to think big. It's not selfish to own, to buy and to own. I believe that selfishness is when you have so little that you don't want to give and you can't give because you don't have enough. I don't think that's what God intended. You know what I've noticed? I've noticed this, that it's the people who have a lot are the people who can give a lot. Interesting, isn't it? Simple, but it's true. And remember who it all belongs to in the first place anyway. I have a title deed for my car, and my name is written on it. I have a title deed for my house. My name is written on it, but it really does not belong to me. It all belongs to God. And because the Bible says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. You know, sometimes we set up limitations around ourselves that God never intended. And we end up limiting ourselves without even realizing it. You know, God wants us to be overcomers. God wants us to be more than conquerors. God wants us to push back the limitations that keep us in small places, places where we need to grow and to change, places where we're frustrated and we're dissatisfied, where you just know in your knower that God has more. God has better for you. You know what? And how do you get it? How do you get more? How do you, get, how do, how do you allow God to give you more and better? It starts with a vision. Let's get a vision, not just for the greatness of God, but let's get a vision for a greater family. Let's get a, a vision for a greater faith walk with God, greater finances. How about a greater self, a greater, a, a, a greater life, being whole, not being broken and messed up anymore, not staying there. How about a greater personal influence to reach people for Jesus? How about a greater church that reaches the world for Jesus? You know, let's celebrate. Jesus, let's celebrate the bigness of God, but let's move forward in every area of our life according to God's powerful word.
Thank you for joining us on The Walk today.